thank you all ever so much um, for taking the time out to join us today. Uh, so I want to firstly uh, thank as well our speakers um, from Welsh Government, as well as colleagues from Swansea University, uh, from the AMBER project, which you'll get to hear a little bit more of towards the end of the webinar. Um, it's 60 minutes. We have a significant questions and answers session at the end, uh, which I'll be hosting. So I'll, I'll rejoin you all then. Um, and please do make use of the Zoom question and answer feature. So if you have questions uh, that you'd like to ask, you can put them in there on Q&A. If you put them in there rather than the chat, we'll get to see them and we'll try to address them all at the end. So without further ado, I'll do a, a small introduction to who uh, I am and, and my organization, and then I'll hand over to our speakers for the session. So my name is Rhys Bowley. I am the manager for the Low Carbon Energy and Environment Research Network Wales, uh, which is a, a Sir Cymru uh, program. And we support and celebrate all of the excellent researchers who are based in Welsh universities, Welsh research centres and facilities um, who work in this low carbon energy and environment space. Now, what do we do? Well, some of you may know us. We started in 2013 and you may know us by the uh, round of funding that we made available from 2013 to 2018 when we were uh, really quite successful in funding eight different research clusters to come together um, some of those clusters still continue today and continue to produce papers and uh, win awards. Um, but nowadays we're, we're focused on these three main activities. Uh, what I will say is that we're hoping for another multi-million pound round of funding. Um, we're planning that in March 2023. May come a little bit earlier, so, so do watch this space. Today we're, we're working on public promotion and advocacy of the excellent researchers who are based here in Wales. Um, so we want to give them a platform with which to spread the good word about their research um, and in order to, to get the attention they all deserve. We also work behind the scenes, uh, lobbying and uh, engaging with government and funding organizations to ensure that there are ever more appropriate as well as larger pots of money uh, for researchers based in Wales to bid into. And then talking of, of government and other organisations, we also facilitate connections. So not just connections between different academics um, looking for other academic researchers. Uh, we also facil facilitate connection between academics and industrial partners, as well as between academics and government and other public sector organisations. So to have a look at some of the examples of what we've been doing in that space recently, uh, you may have seen this on our social media feed. Um, now, in May, Welsh Labour were successful in the Senate elections. So what we did is we took uh, relevant aspects of their manifesto and tried to tie those into societal outcomes that we perceived they were trying to achieve, and then tied those in turn to different areas of research strength that exist here in Wales and in the Welsh universities. And then we even went as far as trying to actually connect those research areas to the leading academics um, in those fields. And we've just had a, a really good example actually with this with uh, Deputy Minister Lee Waters, who was looking for expert opinion uh, in regards to Welsh Labour's ambitions for a national forest for Wales. Now on the promotion side, um, many of you may have seen the brand that we've been championing recently, uh, which we call Small Nation Big Ideas. And this is really shouting about the strengths that are specific to Wales, um, and especially celebrating the fact that Wales is a geographically small nation, um, and that means that it has an extremely tightly knit research community. Uh, many of us will, will know each other, and there are a great deal of long-standing relationships that exist uh, within the Welsh research landscape. Now, on this theme, we are working on a number of um, videos. Uh, we've actually just launched a video series uh, where we have been uh, talking about um, different researchers' uh, strengths and what they are doing in order to combat um, or to adapt to climate change and how their research relates to that. Now, we've formatted these into sort of social media friendly, two minute, one minute pitches about different people's uh, research. 
Um, and this video series is still open. So if uh, you head over to our social media and our web pages, um, there's more information on how you can have a place in this video series and submit some content uh, that we will share far and wide. So if you head over um, to social media, like I say, our, our website, uh, we also have a quarterly newsletter, which I encourage everybody to sign up to um, and have a look at what it is uh, that we've been up to. And you'll find more information on how to get involved with the network. Now, without further ado, I uh, don't want to take any more time. I want you to hear from today's speakers. So I'd like to hand over uh, to uh, our first speaker, Ken Palmer from Welsh Government. Um, and Ken, if I can encourage you to share your screen now. Okay. Did that work this time? We're probably just waiting for the connection a couple more seconds. Right. Who can share? There we go. We can see that. Great. Well, the often very young police, and uh, now uh, Ken Palmer, do we get a um, what the Cymru? I'm Ken Palmer. I'm one of the research and innovation leads in uh, Welsh Government's Horizon Europe unit. So <clears throat> I'm going to spend a few minutes now giving you an introduction to the programme and opportunities. And my colleague Gareth Llewellyn is also part of the meeting. And I'm sure if I miss anything important, he will jump in and add the essential information that I, I miss. So thank you very much, Rhys and Ang Haddad, for the opportunity to uh, make a presentation at this session. I'm going to try and make my slides look more like a presentation. Can somebody just nod their head and say that? that looks that's better? fab. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much indeed. So um, the first thing that everybody will want to know in the question and answers is where do I go for help with Horizon Europe? So that's actually going to be our first slide. You have our email address there in Cymraeg and in English and we have a list of sources of support for you. So uh, the university research officers through the European liaison officers or your equivalent, the UK national contact points who are people with expertise right across the range of Horizon Europe priorities, Welsh higher education in Brussels, uh, the knowledge transfer networks, the KTN, the UK research of office, uh, with the pillar for excellent science and our own uh, four national research networks across Wales. Um, between them, they, these people and organisations produce a wide range of web resources and here's a selected set of highlights. There is, of course, the Horizon Europe website and now that the work programme is live, uh, you have the opportunity to interrogate it as you wish. Um, there's a UK participation question and answer a feature in there. And I do emphasize that the UK as an associated nation to Horizon Europe is able to participate as a full, um, you know, uh, in full with Horizon Europe. Uh, we're waiting for the final signatures to go on the documents, but we are encouraged by our first minister and by the European Commission with great keenness for us to be engaged. So uh, please do get involved. The Knowledge Transfer Network webinars are excellent. Their introduction to Horizon Europe webinar is, I, I believe, essential viewing. And they also give uh, different se sessions for each of the main clusters that we're going to discuss over the next few minutes. The European Partnerships and Horizon Europe Information Days are also very useful. You will see that they are this week, uh, today and tomorrow, Climate, Energy and Mobility cluster as part of the programme. And on Wednesday, there's a virtual brokerage event and I uh, wish to emphasise that to you uh, to participate. Uh, the timetable of calls is available at the next link below. And you can also look at past projects and results because past project success is one indicator of potential candidates for future projects uh, is available at cordiseuropa.eu. Um, we've shared this presentation with Rhys, he can share it with you after this event and all of these links in here are live and I'm grateful again to Gareth for having made it so. Um, the work programmes for 2021 to 2022 have been published quite recently. In combination, they are worth £14.7 billion pounds out of the £95.5 billion, uh, uh, pounds, silly me, euro 
out of the 95 and a half billion euro um, that the Commission has dedicated over 2021 to 27. Uh, you can look at all of these and the reference documents and to search them using the EU funding and tenders portal. Well, I'm not going to read every screen like that, but that's a really important one. What is Horizon Europe? Um, there are three key pillars and two specific objectives. The objectives are to widen participation and spread excellence in the European research community and reform and enhance the European research framework and system. Um, there are five specific EU missions and 49 partnerships, which we can come back under question and answer to in more detail. As I say, the budget, 95 and a half billion euro from the Commission with the match funding from Associate Nations, that's likely to end up at, or could end up with 110, 120 billion euro over seven years. The first main pillar of the programme is around excellent science uh, with the European Research Council, Marie Klodowska Curie Actions for Research and Mobility and Career Development and Research Infrastructures. The second pillar, which uh, we have spent a lot of our focus on, is looking at global challenges and European industrial competitiveness across six clusters. Um, and we'll have a, uh, a look at a couple of the clusters later on in the presentation. Uh, but health, culture, creativity and inclusive society, civil security, digital industry and space, climate, energy and mobility, food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture and the environment. Um, pillar three, Innovative Europe, covers the European Innovation Council, supporting market creating potential and breakthrough at the higher levels of technology readiness for launch the European Innovation Ecosystem and the Institute of Innovation and Technology. Within each of the clusters, whoops, sorry, my foot again, within each of these, there are different types of actions which are described in detail in their general conditions. But research innovation actions um, will net you up to 100% funding rate and you need three legal entities from member states, MS, or associated countries, AC. And they aim primarily to establish new knowledge or explore feasibilities of new or improved technologies, products, processes, services, and solutions. There are innovation actions which achieve up to 70% funding or 100% for nonprofit organizations, also requiring a collaboration amongst three legal entities from member states or associated communities. And that international collaboration is key to both of those types of action. Um, uh, at least one member state has to be involved in each action as well as associate um, communities. Of course it's not limited to three and many many collaborations include many more. Those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, Horizon 2020 and its predecessors will know um, this in detail. And the third type of action is the coordination and support actions that contribute to the objectives of Horizon Europe. Uh, the proposals, when they're put in, are ranked against three types of award criteria. So whether you're, whether you're doing research innovation, innovation or coordination and support, any submission will be assessed against its excellence, its impact and the quality and efficiency of its innovation. And the kind of criteria we're talking about with excellence are uh, what is the current state of the art in that subject area and how is this piece of research going to go beyond it? Is there a clear competitor analysis and can you show where your research proposal takes you one better with, again, uh, in comparison with what competitors are currently doing? In terms of impact, the Commission are looking for more than just a paper. They're looking for the effects on or the and the involvement with users and the change that will create. How will this make a difference to them? And how will it make a difference to European policy and objectives? What is the overall credibility of what you're doing and the change it's intended to create? In terms of quality and efficiency, how realistic is this proposal? Are the best people involved? Are the resources allocated appropriately? Are the outcomes measurable? And have they been adapted or, or molded 
to suit the different needs and the different profiles and uh, different cultures of each participant organization. What are those results and what are the consequences that are you know, likely to come from the results of research? And uh, these uh, extra little statements are things that we've drawn from the research criteria uh, that uh, the EU publish and the information that we've been getting from uh, the training sessions that, that our team put on uh, to assist people with, with it. So we can come back to training, learning and development opportunities later. Excuse me if I sound a bit hoarse, I'm recovering from a, an illness. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Potential areas in, that might interest you in the excellent science arena are the European Research Council's uh, uh, Frontier Research Grants, uh, the Maris Glodowska Curie Doctoral Training Networks, and the deadlines for those start in November 21, and that's a 2020 deadline of November next year. Staff exchanges, where the next deadline is 9th of March next year, and again in March 2023 for short term international and intersectoral exchanges of staff, and postdoctoral fellowships. Now, the 2021 deadline for those is October 21 and the next year is, is September 22, to support researcher career and fostering ex excellence in research. It's particularly aimed at postdoctoral research for success. So they may interest you. Um, and if we look at the clusters amongst the work programs and just take for a few examples, climate energy and mobility, climate sciences and responses for transformation towards climate neutrality, there are over, overall, there are more than 400 work programs across the whole of Horizon Europe. But some of the ones that we found in uh, the climate sector include battery value changes, chains, breakthrough technologies, climate solutions, citizens and stakeholder engagement, and communities and cities. So a vast range of socio-economic and technological societal opportunities for research and innovation. We've called deadlines that are getting quite tight now for 2021, uh, but are good for 2022. 44 topics and five calls in there. In energy, looking at sustainable, secure and competitive energy supplies, systems, grids, storage, carbon capture, utilization and storage, and cross-cutting issues. Um, with, again, deadlines starting from October 21 and rolling out to January 23, efficient, sustainable and inclusive energy use as well. So plenty for interested parties to get in, uh, in, engaged with. Each of the work programmes is summarised in, in the European documentation in a relatively short section. All the sections are in their documents are written in a consistent format. Um, and are easy to access. We can also help you uh, with finding those. Um, in the food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture and environment section, there are seven um, different areas of work around biodiversity and ecosystem, fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food systems right the way through the, the, the chain from primary production to consumption, circular economy and bioeconomy sectors, clean environment and zero pollution lands, oceans and water for climate action, resilient, inclusive, green, coastal, rural and urban communities, and innovative governance, environmental observations and digital solutions in support of the Green Deal. Now, many of these also uh, chime with the new Senate and ministers' policies, circular economy, uh, innovation in govern governance, using uh, global observation to support um, green innovation and uh, green infrastructure developments across Wales. So there are, again, considerable number of things where we have a potential win-win, where from our point of view of government, um, they're meeting uh, the the current political agenda. From the research point of view, they're looking at uh, very positive environmental outcomes and from the individual researcher opportunities, a vast range and diversity of things to uh, engage with. Um, again, the, uh, some of the deadlines are getting very, very tight. So we'd suggest you start, if you're interested in these areas, looking at the February 2022 uh, um, core closes. How can we help? Um, the Horizon Europe unit in Welsh Government 
uses the SCORE Cymru Fund. SCORE is an abbreviation for supporting collaborative research and innovation in Europe. We do our best as part of the framework of support for Welsh organisations accessing Horizon Europe um, to investigate the science and innovation agenda. We can support people developing pilots. We have funding we can use to help you develop collaborations, to build uh, consortia and to create um, the best possible quality uh, proposals and submissions. Uh, we can fund uh, training and support to enable those things as well. Um, you know, so you can get good bid writing, you can engage with prospective partners, you can gain wider visibility in Brussels, and uh, of course we help with research and mobility technology transfer issues as well. We currently have a live call to maximise engagement in Horizon Europe and increase um, cooperation with Irish Sea Developments, and the deadline for that application is Friday 20th of August, so you have some time. Uh, in which to have a look at that. And you can find that um, call on gov.wales. You can find it through our e-news that we publish. And I know Reese can circulate our, e our most recent e-news editions uh, after this event. And to give you an idea of our uh, just pure fiscal success of 0.6 million pounds invested, we brought in over eight and a half million pounds of research and innovation funding to Wales. So uh, this uh, small score seed funding can reap quite significant uh, rewards and benefits for everybody in Wales and you know in the way that it supports particular work programs and proposals. A couple of examples, Bangor University partnered with uh, organisations in Sweden uh, to look at opportunities for collaboration. They had two publications accepted in international journals, PhD placements set up, new PhD studentship working on the collaboration to discover areas for growth, creating direct impact on recruitment strategies and enabling future uh, uh, development in their area. Um, an international peer-to-peer -peer pilot between Wales and the Basque Country was organised uh, to test out the potential for uh, Zoom and, and similar technology sessions, uh, looking at cyber security and food. Two sets of three pilot meetings produced a safe environment for discussion on new markets and trade, better well-being, new processes and product lines, and developed a community of interest amongst people who wanted to uh, take up uh, the information produced through those sessions. We demonstrated the contract concept and lessons were learned on adapting to international cooperation and working in that uh, bilateral environment. So another great success. Um, Horizon Europe is a small unit. Hopefully you'll regard it as a small, highly mobile and intelligent unit. Uh, Baldwin Morgan uh, heads our team. Vanessa Davis, Gareth Llewellyn and I are the research and innovation leads, each taking particular areas of interest. Lina Hoff manages the money and Siobhan McMurdo provides the rest of the support that makes everything work well. We are dedicated to helping Welsh, uh, support Welsh involvement in Horizon Europe programme. That is what we do. And we believe very strongly that joined up support is greater than the sum of its parts. We work collaboratively as our first slide about resources suggests, uh, with uh, UK national contact points, knowledge transfer networks, the Welsh higher education, European liaison officers within universities, private, public and voluntary sectors as well. So uh, thank you very much for letting me gallop through uh, a lot of information. We will be happy to uh, take questions from you. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Ken. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and yeah, we're really highlighting the, uh, the top end support that's available here in Wales, another major benefit of the uh, small nation with big ideas. So what I'd like to do now is uh, hand over to our next speaker, uh, who's from Swansea University, and that is Professor Carlos Garcia de Lines. And I would like to introduce uh, or invite Carlos, if you want to share your screen, if you have slides, um, to talk about the AMBA project, uh, which is a fantastic example of multi-million pound funding um, from the Horizon 2020 programme. So over to you, Carlos. 
Okay, <clears throat> so thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present uh, some of the results of Amber. So I'm going to tell you what my experience was about putting this uh, Horizon 2020 application together called Amber. Okay, so why this particular project? Uh, what we did was to identify a very important knowledge gap. And this particular knowledge gap was to do with uh, river fragmentation. The EU had identified fragmentation of rivers as one of the main environmental stressors, and yet, as late as 2016, they acknowledged that they didn't know the numbers. They just didn't know the extent of this problem. So for us, this was a turning point. So, <clears throat> you know, going to, to this issue, as uh, Dan, Donald Ransford had said, the biggest problem is really not what we don't know, but what we don't know, we don't know, is what he called the unknown unknowns. And we very much capitalize on this concept to try to impress upon them that they could hardly solve a problem if they didn't know the extent of the problem itself. So I'm going to summarize eight lessons that we have learned from this particular project. So lesson number one, I think you need to have a vision. I think that uh, you need to have a name. You need to have a clear output and you need to have the right. So in our particular case, the vision was uh, relatively simple, which was what we uh, summarized by this let it flow campaign. We capitalized on the fact that the commission had identified fragmentation as a problem, and we were there to try to solve this problem. So for us, this vision was very clear, was let it flow. We had a very clear output from the very beginning. We knew that if we did well, this could be potentially a very impactful output, scientific output, and in fact it was. It was to produce the first pan-European comprehensive atlas of stream barriers across Europe. And that was very easy to sell during the project because it was something that everybody acknowledged it was needed and it was not there. We also had to choose a name and we chose adaptive management, which is something that most managers would understand of barriers in European rivers and that for this wonderful word amber, which again, it helped us to spread the message. And finally, and uh, this is extremely important, is to have the right mix of people. And you need to have a balanced uh, heterogeneous group that complements different areas of expertise. In our particular case, we have 20 partners from 11 countries across the whole of Europe and although it was heavily biased towards uh, the scientific or the research community with eight universities, we also had uh, four industrial partners, four NGOs, and four government organizations. So lesson two, how do we do this? How do you build your consortium? Well, I think that most of us uh, that have been on this for some time now, they will know that you have your network and your network expands uh, by contacting people that know people. So this is a snowballing concept. So we started with basically a core group of friends, of colleagues that had worked together on previous new projects. And from this initial core group, which was about uh, eight uh, core members, we contacted the very uh, necessary industry uh, group that we didn't know at all. But one of our core group had very good contacts with, in this case, one of the main European hydropower companies. And from this big company, other smaller uh, commercial sponsors were contacted. And then finally, the group uh, spread or uh, grew by uh, uh, attracting other partners that had uh, formed part of another project that was not successful because ours was a two-stage project and they decided to join us. So um, important things that I would uh, regard as tips is that I think that strategically it makes sense to invite your strongest competitors. You want them on your consortium. You don't want them as referees and you don't want them in a competing consortium, that's for sure. The second tip, which I think was useful in our case, is that you need to be able to write a one-page concept note, no more than one page, you need to spell out very clearly what exactly is it that you're addressing and how do you intend to go about it. And <clears throat> one, thing that, uh, one thing that is important is that you need to resist a phone cost to let partners invite other partners without you knowing because that can really antagonize people if you have to uninvite them 
and that is the surest way to make enemies. And remember, some of these people that have been uninvited may end up reviewing your land. So it's very important to keep control and to keep track about the size of the basement. So lesson number two <clears throat> in my particular case uh, is that you need to understand the goal very well. You need to understand the difference between a single stage, which was our case, versus a two-stage application, and the very important difference between a research and innovation action, which is what research plays a stronger part than in an innovation action, as we were told in a mo just a moment ago, and also between uh, cons uh, the, uh, the CSA, uh, community or uh, support actions. And very early on, I received a very good piece of advice that I'm going to relay back to you by uh, somebody who had experience uh, on this, was that you need to write two proposals. The proposal that is going to get you the grant and the proposal that will get the work done. And they are not necessarily the same thing. So you need to concentrate on the first one initially. Forget about how you're going to go about it. You need to basically write and cheat and use the right words to make sure that you land the grant, and then you can worry about how on earth you're going to do it. So <clears throat> uh, in that, um, uh, two tips that, I might, that we can give you is that we use a wordle, we extract it from the goal, every single buzzword, every single keyword, and we try to understand where the emphasis was, and that was quite useful. And the second tip, is that it's very useful to use the score sheets that the referees are going to use for marking your application when you are writing it. So that was a very useful piece of advice in that case. The fourth lesson is that you need to write for dummies. You need to write to sell. You are not writing to impress you. And uh, remember that unlike in the research councils, the easy reviewers in some of these applications, they are not experts. They are experts on broad topic. They are not necessarily experts on this particular topic. Many are applicants, successful or otherwise, just like you. And this is very important to remember, writing a grant application is not the same as writing a paper, as big as it might be. You cannot write a grant by a committee, and you need to designate a core group that will check that you are doing that. One piece of advice is presentation is key because people are very busy. They are going to review a lot of applications and the use of stunning, fantastic, wonderful infographics. I think this key nowadays. And finally, you need to make sure that you tick all the call, all the all the boxes, all the, key, all the keywords in the call. The fifth lesson that we learn is that you need to learn your body. I found this poster quite revealing, quite funny. Is about the an anatomy of authorship. And I think the same thing can be applied to the anatomy of writing a grant. Obviously, you're going to be the brain. You're supposed to know what's going on. You're not supposed to know uh, exactly what the vision is. But you cannot write a grant if you don't have the other organs. And you're going to need hearts, which are going to push everything forward. You're going to need a lung. You're going to need a liver. You're going to need all the other organs. In particular, you're going to need also stomachs that are going to be able to digest this information and then be absolutely ruthless to try to extract the essentials from what you have written uh, out. And this normally consists in our experience from a core group of three, four people out of 60 perhaps, uh, which are going to do most of the work. The sixth lesson, and I'm coming to an end, is that perhaps in our case, the hardest part was to survive the budget. That was an absolute nightmare, it's probably the most difficult part of writing the application. And uh, although the EC is quite relaxed, to be honest, they don't ask much, the institution may not be. And um, everybody will complain. That's a fact. You can count on it. Everybody will complain and you need to be prepared for that. So the coordinator normally in Horizon 2020 grants, depending on the type, will normally get the lion's share. In our case, it was quite high, it was 18% of the budget but normally it's going to be between 10 and 14%. And remember that in research and innovation actions, most of the money funds are going to go on salaries. In innovation actions, that's different. Perhaps much more will go on impact than will go on capital. And I would give you a piece of advice is that you need to manage your partner's expectations. And the earlier than the sooner you do it, the better. So you need to tell them early on what they might get in terms of funding, without really being absolutely committed because things may change. 
And finally, don't let partners get carried away with expenditures which are not going to be affordable or worse, they will be ineligible for. So it's very, very important to make that distinction. And finally, I think it's important, I think most of you will share this with me, that it's very lonely out there. You need to be prepared to suffer. Remember that success rate is uh, less than 10%. In some calls, it was as low as 2%. It's going to be very hard work. I have the luxury of being able to invest six months, but now that's no longer the case because some of these calls are only given us two months. The first hurdles, no doubt, will be in your own institution. You may not be aware of all the legal requirements that you have to go through before you can submit your application, and you need to be aware about that. And remember that everybody here is trying to do. And finally, and some of my colleagues may disagree with this, but in my experience, this is a number two. So you will probably need to submit five, six, 10, depending on how lucky you are, major grants before you land one. So lack and opportunity play a very important part. Don't despair. And my advice would be don't waste too much time refining something because it may make very little difference. And it might be that in some cases, it's better to invest that time in writing more grants, i.e. in throwing more darts. And remember, and although this is changing in some recent calls, unlike a paper, you can't resubmit an easy grant in most cases. So it's a gain all or lose all gain. And that means that the possibilities for recovering your effort are limited, but there are some uh, things that you can do. The network that you have created uh, can be used in future applications. Perhaps the material that you have worked so hard to put together can be used in a review paper, and we have done that. And of course, that can uh, prepare the, the, the road for other grants. And with that, if you have any questions, I would be quite happy to address them. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Carlos. That was absolutely great. And uh, yeah, I, I really like the part about uh, being willing to suffer. Um, as I'm sure many of us uh, are either just starting to uh, experience uh, as early career researchers or, or uh, long veterans in, in going through the review process. Um, but yes, do remember it's not, uh, it's not personal, um, it's just highly critical whenever we're spending the public purse. But no, thank you ever so much and, and thank you for, for joining us to share a, a candid experience of uh, what it was like for you as, as the lead PI on, on AMBER. So what I would like to do now is uh, take the last 20 minutes of the session um, in order to have a question and answer uh, discussion. Um, what I will do is I'll look into the question and answer box that we have here on the webinar. Um, if you do have any questions, make sure you get in there now uh, and post those so that we can try and address them all. Um, and also, if, if you'd like, uh, you can also ask your question um, over audio. If you uh, raise your hand, we will keep an eye out for that um, and we can try to unmute a microphone for you in that specific uh, scenario. So what, what I will do is um, looking at this now, I will just answer the uh, first questions that came in to the panel um, on some of the more technical sides. So uh, can the slides uh, with the links be sent out? Yes, absolutely. I'll send a PDF of, of all the slides out afterwards um uh in in the days following the event that's no problem at all and uh yeah thank you very much uh panel for helping answer the the questions will it be recorded yes we are recording and i'll make sure that that goes live on the uh website for the uh, low carbon energy and environment research network wales now over to questions for some of our panel members um, Ken, if I can start with you, uh, the top one here asks, uh, one of the sections mentioned on an early horizon slide was widening participation. Where is it best to find funding opportunities in this area? And I can see that you've uh, noticed that question. So if I can hand over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, whoever sent that question in, it would be really good if you could advise me whether you meant widening participation in education generally, because that's actually my professional background, or widening uh, uh, participation in um, research and innovation. My colleague Gareth has uh, sent me a whole load of links uh, 
from HEU website pages around the widening participation in research and innovation work, which I will happily share with Reese after the, or we will happily share with Reese after the meeting and include in the circulation information. Um, and I hope that answers your question, but if it was specifically around widening participation in science, technology, education, then do come back to us because that's a slightly different subject. Fantastic, thank you ever so much, Ken. Um, so just working down uh, the list of questions in, in popularity, um, one asks, uh, what, what is the best way to find European partners during COVID times, um, especially with travel restrictions, um, and as, especially as an early career researcher? So I, I can um, just, just say that as, as the network, we represent the researchers based here in Wales, um, and we, we're always trying to um, connect those who come with inward investment um, queries or, uh, or are looking for partners inside of Wales. Um, so we'll often uh, share news uh, about partners from Europe or from outside of Wales um, who are looking, uh, looking for particular strengths uh, inside our small nation. Um, but this, this question, I think, is more related to trying to go outside, especially when you're early career and trying to, to grow your network. Um, Carlos, can I hand that question to you first? And then I might come back to uh, Ken and Gareth as well. I think that in this um, in Horizon um, Europe now, there are schemes that enable partners to register their interest. So I think the European Commission is actively promoting uh, this networking. And there are several schemes um, but to be honest, I think that uh, um, it's just, uh, you know, building a network takes a little bit of time and uh, you just need to identify who are the key players in your particular field in the country and uh, further afield. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Ken, I see you got your hand up if you want to chip in as well. Yes, it's the, the manual rather than the digital <laughs> hand way thing going on today. Um, one of the things I did when I, I joined the Horizon team here about 15 months ago was look through the previous uh, funding program, Horizon 2020, using uh, some simple uh, combinations of search words of subjects of interest to me and subjects that related to our work to find out who had been doing which kind of projects and then going back into the Cordis database and seeing who had produced successful activities. Um, and the kind of outcomes they had uh, with a view to potentially being able uh, to contact the, the Welsh one saying, hey, we've got this new funding coming up. Are you interested? I think the same thing might be useful if you're looking for potential partners for your uh, research areas uh, for new pieces of research too. Cordis shows what people have done. It's a historical uh, gazette of, of what's been achieved and uh, you'll be able to see who have been successful, sometimes who've been successful many times. I mean, imagine if they're putting things together as well as Carlos's advice suggests, uh, they'll come up fairly easily. So, Excellent advice. Thank you, Ken. And, and yeah, another one that um, I'm uh, familiar with using if, if you uh, are Gareth, looking... Sorry, oh, Gareth's yeah. got his hand. And yes, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Gareth, do you want to chip in as well? Sorry, there's not to break the flow with the next question, but just want to add to the idea of finding, <clears throat> finding partners during COVID. Um, in addition to past project, projects that Ken mentioned, which is, which is good advice, I mean, I would add to that, you know, using universities' existing contacts. You know, a lot of projects exist within Wales under the previous programme, Horizon 2020. So the universities will have existing contacts, like, for example, through the AMBER project. But also on slide two, Ken highlighted the EC information brokerage event, which is on Wednesday. So if any of these opportunities in the cluster five take it interest, that's a key opportunity to go ahead and meet some partners around Europe. So one for your diaries. No, excellent. No, thank you very much. And of, of course, there are re research and innovation support um, departments vary across the universities in Wales. I, I've got experience with uh, with a number of them, um, but do do make sure you're engaging with those too. Um, and if if your institution is a subscriber to Research Professional and you're able to use an institutional login there, that is also uh, another really good way at looking at uh, researchers, especially based here in the UK. Um, uh, and you can filter by what they've won in a number of different ways, um, but you can filter by Horizon 2020, which is uh, one of the ones that I've, I've used in the past. Fantastic. 
Okay, so um, looking down now at the list of questions, uh, Ken and Gareth, this is, is one for you. Um, is there a limit on score funding? Can it be more, one more than once? Gareth's got years more experience with score funding than I have, but uh, why I, I'm not, there is a limit on score funding for individual bids. There is a limit on the overall amount of money we have. We would prefer to look at a few really, really good bids rather than just scattergun um, uh, stuff around. So that's why we're looking for opportunities to develop high quality bids. But I see Gareth's come back live again, so I'll pass over to him as well. Just, just to add that, that you know, um, as Ken says, there are limits to the certain amount of funding we can invest for different interventions, um, but there's no limit to the amount of times you can you can bid in for that support, and we can make iterative investments of support as well. So, just to add that in. Fantastic, thank you. Um, now, th there's a, a question uh, there from Yasir, who's asking what funding opportunities exist for mid-career researchers. Um, especially those who are migrant here in Wales. And uh, I think that's a, a fantastic question, actually. There's uh, often such um, you know, sort of attention uh, given to early career researchers, uh, especially, you know, we think of them as, as having their, um, you know, a, a brand new career portfolio without uh, much of an existing network, um, but equally as important as those in mid-career uh, who need to, you um, you know, make the transition perhaps from uh, looking at the smaller bids towards the, the larger um, grants as well as, uh, as keeping the ball rolling. So I'll, I'll throw this one open to the panel. Who wants to chip in there? I think I'll start with uh, have a good read through the criteria for applications to the Mary Sklodowska Curie Fund and see if there is anything that fits your personal or particular circumstances in there. It's not just for new postdoctoral researchers, it is for uh, uh, professional development and knowledge exchange as well. Fantastic, thank you, Ken. Um, so what I'll do now is just look, uh, we have one from Andy Schofield, um, who says from past experience, bidding for EU funds, uh, though not with academia, um, applications could include financial and in-kind match funding contributions. Uh, the latter are often all uh, that some organisations can afford to contribute. And then, yes, we, we've been in that boat before. Uh, Andy, I can definitely uh, sympathise with that. Um, are in-kind match funding contributions permissible elements of applications to Horizon? OK, so um, there, are two there, there are different aspects of Horizon. And if we're talking about the work packages, then you are putting in a submission for funding for that work package. You are not putting in contributions to it necessarily. So uh, your partnership, your collaborative partnership might appreciate an exchange of uh, non-financial expertise uh, and contributions, but that's amongst you in developing your, your, your collaborative uh, group. What, there's another kind of um, opportunity within Horizon that uh, we haven't talked about, which is the partnership level, which is the level which starts to decide what the work programs are. And that does require investment and that does require significant financial investment to get involved. But then you are looking at either an all Wales consortium level bid into it or a governmental level bid into it um you know so we're, we're talking much more money you know, or a major company bid into it i don't know andy where you work uh, if you're working for something the size of airbus then you might be familiar with that kind of thing but uh, um that's about the best i can do on that one i don't know if carlos can help out no yes i was going to i completely agree but i was going to say that unlike the grant applications that we tend to write in this country for rcuk and so on the ec is normally very relaxed about the budget and uh, i found them extremely helpful um they will invite you to negotiate the budget the budget will change that's okay which you know in other goals in other grants is, is unheard of but here they will and you can adjust things and then can move things around so they are very very relaxed about it and they're very helpful 
So uh, quite frankly, when they review the applications, I don't think the budget is very important for them. They are mostly focused on the idea. They are mostly focused on what it is that we are trying to address and how is that going to be useful to Europeans. So I would not uh, spend too much time, uh, you know, invest too much effort in the budget, to be honest. Um, just keep it simple and knowing that you will have the possibility to rectify any shortcoming later on. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. Um, I can just see that there's uh, one one question, um, is, you know, is, is it wise for early career researchers to take lead on developing a proposal for Horizon Europe calls? Um, but I, I think Horizon Europe is is so broad there are so many areas like we we've, we've discussed um uh already there are specific early career uh researcher and development sections um but i i guess the question might actually be leaning towards um looking at the the main sort of pillar to uh the clusters within that and and the large calls there um i I would say uh, that, uh, that that's an entire separate webinar that we could go into the sort of tactics for building out your career as an early career researcher, um, but that there are uh, networks such as ourselves and networks within Europe as well with whom we're connected, um, whereby you can be a, a contributor to a consortium um, rather than the leader, uh, which, which may well be one tactic uh, in order to, to employ. Um, does anybody else want to chip into that or, or shall I move? Yes, I, I would advise that uh, because in some of these calls, they require exclusivity. If you're going to lead a project, uh, the partners uh, need to make a decision. Are they going to join you or are they going to join somebody else? And inevitably, when you're starting, you don't have a lot of experience. You don't know many people, so it's an act of faith. And I think the way to gain that experience is to join a system consortium and become perhaps a work package leader. So then you can spend four or five years leading a particular work package. You will get to know how a large project works together, and that will prepare you to become a project leader in you know, four, three, ten years' time. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for the advice, Carlos. So I'm looking down now, I think we've covered all of the questions and answers that have been posted. Um, I just want to, to give the panel one minute. Is, is there anything else that uh, you'd like to raise or cover? No? Nope. Only to wel welcome inquiries to Horizon Europe at gov.wales if people want stuff. And to, to thank everybody for participating. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you all ever so much. So yeah, thanks uh, once again to our, our panel members and speakers and thank you all very much for making time to be with here, us here today. Uh, hopefully this has, has inspired you and uh, made clear the case that Horizon Europe is a major opportunity um, for funding uh, both large and small into Wales and uh, that there is unique support available to you um, being based at Welsh research institutions. Uh, so without further ado, I will give you uh, seven minutes of your day back. Um, thank you all once again. I will send out a recording in the days following the event. All the best and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.